Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there, I'm your host Simon. What happens here if you're new? One of my writers in this case, Chris, thank you Chris, has written me a script. I'm gonna read it, I've never read it before. This is a story that of course I'm, that of course I'm familiar with because everybody is familiar with it. Today we're covering Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and that means this comment section I'm sure is gonna be crazy. And this is one of those ones, I mean there's a lot of conspiracy theories around this or the, the one big conspiracy theory like about jeffrey epstein killing himself and then did he have this little book with all of these people who are also like predators and stuff right uh, again like i'm familiar with this story like most people are but not much in depth that is absolutely going to change after this beast of an episode uh but this is one of those conspiracy theories that is kind of like like the moon landing and stuff obviously real like that is just like uh, without question and then there's like conspiracy theories where you're like hmm it's probably something there isn't there like the jfk thing it's always like that's too weird for the to be not something there do i know what that is no does it seem enormously suspicious yes jeffrey epstein just happens to kill himself and that those cameras and guards were just happen to be missing and he just happens to know all of these secrets about all of these very powerful people. Again, it's like one of those conspiracy theories where you're like, hmm, probably something there, isn't there? <laughs> or is that just me? I feel like this is one of the, it's, this is a more believable conspiracy theory, right? Anyway, let's just jump into it. Uh, yeah, sexual abuse, pyramid scheme style. That's the title Chris gave it. I might have made it more clickable. That's quite clickable, isn't it? Maybe the title will be that. You'll be looking at the title right now and being like, Simon respected Chris, Chris's uh, artistic freedom, or he didn't. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein shouldn't really need any introduction, being probably the most famous serial sex offender in recent memory. I feel like that's a, that's a great um, time for the use of the word infamous, Chris, rather than famous. Uh, and the subject of numerous conspiracy theory narratives, some plausible, some true, and some completely insane. Oh yeah, I'm sure that- I didn't realize there were so many conspiracy theories. I'm sure there are insane ones. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, he was a lizard. He was a lizard and he's in cahoots with the queen. He's using lizard DNA. I'll say up front that I'm not a conspiracy theory fan. This is partly because so many of them are so paper thin and silly. Shout out to the masterfully ironic birds aren't real. <laughs> what? <laughs> You liar! <laughs> what the f are birds then? I walk like past 700 pigeons on my way to work. What do you think they are? Like CIA spy drones? Come on, people, stop smoking so much crack. It's not good for you. I do what I want. But it's mostly owing to my career having so frequently compelled me to study and investigate actual criminal conspiracies. But the Epstein case transcends the debate between conspiracy and cock up in a magnificent way. What we have here is a complex and ongoing criminal conspiracy, one which shines a harsh light on the criminal justice system, the corruption of wealth and power, and the very real inequalities which make so many the prey of the rich and powerful. But it's not all doom and gloom. The other side of the story is the long and tortuous journey of those seeking to bring him to justice, a sort of spotlight moment which provides a heartening example of the capacity for motivated and principled individuals to achieve some measure of justice even when the very institutions designed to protect us have been corrupted. However, I mean in the case of Jeffrey Ep Epstein, he's dead, ain't he? Like, whatever happened to him, he's dead, and he probably didn't want to be dead. He probably wanted to continue being a weird sexual predator on an island, didn't he? And now he's dead. Yay! Justice prevails! But then also, didn't that other guy, the the rapey guy, um, what's his f***ing name? Who was the TV dude? How am I forgetting this guy's name? He was like the host of a TV sh children's TV show, and he was sent to prison for like rape uh, and like uh, date raping people and stuff. <laughs> and then he got released on some technicality, and you're like, what the f*** is going on? Rich people never suffer. Unless you're Jeffrey Epstein, in which case you're dead. Beyond the tabloid headlines and lurid, sometimes pornographic reporting, lies a damning failure on the part of key civil institutions to protect the vulnerable against the powerful. In fact, initially, they did exactly the opposite. Yeah, that's another thing. It's like, yeah, I know. It's like, yay, Jeffrey Epstein's dead. Um, but also, he got away with his crimes for a really long time. And didn't, he was already, like, people knew he was a pedo, like, back in the day. And he, he was like... Did he do time in jail or was it kind of just swept under the rug or something? But people knew he was dodgy. 
And like famous people continue to hang out with him. Which is a bit weird, isn't it? And by a bit weird, I mean it's a lot weird, isn't it? But it's also an inspiring tale of a small group of individuals' selfless dedication to justice, especially Julie K. Brown of the Miami Herald, and of the courage of a handful of victims who over literal decades refused to be silenced, even while their powerful opponent used every resource and connection he had to ruin their lives and reputations, intimidate them, and silence them. And then, of course, there's the highly dubious deaths of Epstein and his close associate Jean-Luc Brunel. I'm aware a lot of people have passionate opinions on the subject, and while we can't promise to be in 100% agreement on some of the wilder theories, I can say that the facts of the case are such that it's not possible to 100% dismiss them either. And now, with that out of the way, let's dive into the dark world of industrialized sexual abuse. Brilliant, this is going to be a fun one. When you've got a script and it says the words industrialized sexual abuse, you know you're in for a bad time. The Great Gatsby The world of finance is naturally a secretive one. If you've got a whole bunch of money, one of the first things you want to ensure is that no one's going to be able to nick all of it. And one of the best ways to do that is to make it very difficult to determine exactly how much you have and where all of it is. This is like one of those things, you know those rich lists and stuff where it's like, uh, and you can like Google like different celebrities and net worths and stuff. It's all bullshit. Because unless, I mean, if you're like the CEO and you've got shares in like a giant company, it's public like how many shares of stuff you have. It's like, otherwise, unless you're that person, there's no real way to know because you don't know how much people, these places don't know how much people earn. That's private. They don't know how much people spend. That's also private. They can take a wild ass guess, but uh, it's, it's always wrong. The result of this need is a sort of commercial and social natural selection favoring people who are discreet, who can keep secrets, and who like to maintain a low public profile. This is almost the exact opposite of the business world, where fame and notoriety are often viewed as primary assets. Think Elon Musk and Donald Trump. But for people behind the curtain, so to speak, the ones who pull the levers, facilitate the loans and conveyancing, and manage asset holdings and tax minimization, their world is normally more or less invisible to the general public. But even in this pathologically discreet little subculture, Jeffrey Epstein was known as a mysterious man. Even those closest to him knew very little about his life, where he'd come from, where he got his money, who his clients were. All this and more were shrouded in mystery. One source interviewed for a New York Magazine profile said, He's this mysterious Gatsby-esque figure. He likes people to think that he's very rich, and he cultivates this air of aloofness. The whole thing is weird. I mean, it's also, if you just want to be a quietly rich person, it's not unreasonable. Like, not everyone wants to be going around, like, rolling in Lambos and shit. Just, just quietly being rich sounds, I don't know, sounds kind of better, doesn't it? Because then no one's going to try and nickel your money, you don't have people hassling you, you don't have, like, all of the fake friends. It just sounds better to just be quietly rich. <laughs> I understand you, Jeffrey! <laughs> I don't believe what I'm hearing. I joking You're breaking my heart yeah, but i get this a little bit what we do know about him is that he was born in new york growing up in coney island a rat infested sewer of crime and poverty or one of the nicest places in the world depending on which side of town you live his father was a parks department employee epstein was academically gifted skipping two years and graduating high school at 16. he studied at cooper union and nyu both prestigious universities before dropping out for no clear reason and getting a job teaching maths and physics at the Dalton School. I didn't realize schools would... I feel like if you're teaching maths and physics at school, no matter how bright you are, you need to have a degree, don't you? The Dalton School is a prestigious prep school and arts academy which attracts gifted and affluent students. <laughs> you can either be skilled or your parents can be rich. That's who we're accepting at our school. <laughs> Welcome to America, land of meritocracy and also money. And look, I also know the UK is like this, so uh, yeah. I just, I don't know, just because this is set in America, it was easy to poke fun at America. Look, I know the UK is also the same. In 1974, the year Epstein blagged his way into a teaching job without qualifications, the outgoing principal was ex-attorney general William Barr's father. Rupert Murtaugh's daughter was a student at Dalton while Epstein taught there, and the school's alumni figures include the likes of Anderson Cooper and Claire Danes. Holy sh that school's got some alumni. He was reportedly a charismatic 
charismatic teacher, though some students described him as overfamiliar, especially with the female students. Not something you want in a teacher! He was only 21 years old at the time, though, and it seems he was mentally somewhat younger, so perhaps there's nothing sinister in that. When questioned about it in 2009, however, he pled the fifth to dodge the question, so maybe there was. In any case, he wasn't there long before a new headmaster came in, noticed he wasn't particularly good at teaching, and sacked him. As with so much to do with Epstein, it's impossible to know his plans or motives for so many things, but it seems that he had become impressed with the power and influence of the parents and students at the school. Possibly as part of a larger plan, he made an effort to impress one of the parents at a P&T night, a man who happened to be a senior partner at Bear Stearns, the merchant bank. This executive persuaded Bear Stearns' CEO to hire him, which turned out to be the first step in Epstein's journey into super wealth. Okay, Epstein's gotta be like fair, you know, they said he was charismatic as a teacher. If you're a teacher, a 21-year-old teacher who got fired from their job and you managed to charm a Bear Stearns, what was it, senior partner, into persu- who knows the CEO of Bear Stearns, so not just some regular senior partner who's like four levels down, but someone who can go to the CEO and get someone a job, um, that speaks to charisma. During his time at Bear, Epstein showed a talent for a whole portfolio of financial management. Quite a few people dubbed him a genius, saying that he had a talent for synthesis, that rarest of intellectual abilities where one is able to cross-connect and interrelate across a range of disparate disciplines and combine them to arrive rapidly and accurately at understandings or solutions. Of course, there were many dissenters from this view, notably one man who said of Epstein that he had never received a straight answer from him and that it was all smoke and mirrors. He told Vox, I never saw any brilliance, I never saw him work. Anybody I know that is that wealthy works 26 hours a day. This guy plays 26 hours a day. Well, it just sounds like he's doing better than you, doesn't it? Because he's getting rich. Like, one thing about Jeffrey Epstein, very, very, very rich. And uh, he doesn't seem to be working very hard, does he? So... Seems like he's got you beat on that one. <laughs> Why am I defending Jeffrey Epstein? Oh, it feels dirty. Because it is. For every person claiming that Epstein was some kind of ethereal genius, there's another who characterizes him as a dumbass poser. It's not been possible to find anyone who ever traded with him, and of the many scientists and intellectuals that Epstein held dinner parties with, more than half reports that he didn't know what he was talking about and spent more time trying to look smart than adding to the conversation. One of the best ways to look smart, though, is to be quiet. Like, if you open your mouth, people know you're dumb. If you don't open your mouth, they don't know you're dumb, and you just kind of look mysterious. Like, didn't, didn't, I guess Dep- Epstein maybe discovered this later. Like, if you're around smart people, just listen to them and uh, ask questions. It makes you look smarter than you are. Pro tip. It's what I do, and it's why everyone thinks I'm such a big brain. <laughs> <laughs> His work at Bear quickly had him charge of billions of dollars in funds, and Epstein was the kind of financial manager who wasn't shy about his own ambitions to wealth. Leslie Wexner, the founder of Limited Brands, a huge company which includes Victoria's Secret in its holding. Oh, it's Victoria's Secret. In my mind, I always had Victoria's Secret. Victoria's Secret makes a lot more sense! Made Epstein his financial advisor and helped him to build a fortune for himself. It's interesting that in a world where reputations are cemented by prestigious client books, every client other than Wexner was kept a closely guarded secret. It's possible that this is because there weren't any others of note. Epstein appears to have built his fortune on being Wexler's water boy and then scamming and brown nosing his way into a space where anyone at all could become rich simply by talking to people and being in the same room. This is a bit contradictory because we had the dude earlier being like, you gotta work 26 hours Day if you want to be rich and now we're saying like no 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 you just got to go to parties and chit chat sounds a bit easier doesn't it regardless of his actual ability there's no doubt epstein wanted to present himself as a lofty thinker he was a keen patron of the sciences forking out millions in grants and gifts for cutting-edge research research which some of his beneficiaries claimed he actually understood unlike many rich patrons. As for his money management, he was out of there well before their spectacular failure in the GFC and was running his own firm. Ah, Global Financial Crisis, GFC. I didn't know we were acronyming that. He considered himself a kind of financial architect, according to New York Magazine, who quoted one of his writings, saying, I want people to understand the power, the responsibility, and the burden of their money. Which is odd. Yeah, I feel so burdened by money. Money's always such a burden. Where to put it, what to buy. (laughs) What a burden. One thing I definitely don't feel, since having more money, is uh, more burdened by money. Having no money is definitely more of a 
fucking burden. What are you talking about? Which is odd as Wexner apparently hired him to find out who was stealing from him and then claimed Epstein had stolen $46 million from him too. It seems both of these men were a little odd, with Wexler acting as Epstein's patron and Epstein hooking Wexler up with dates and party invites. The characterization of Epstein as Gatsby is apt. He was a shadowy man, lauded by some of his acquaintances, but in a curious way, not really containing any substance. And it's clear from his own comments and writings that other people didn't really exist for him as people either, which might be a clue as to why he was willing to inflict such appalling abuse on so many children and young women. And yet, he still seems so utterly convinced he hadn't done anything seriously wrong. Yeah, well, that's just the big mark of a psycho brain, isn't it? It's like, yeah, no, no, no. Like, f always bring it back to Pedro Lopez. He's probably like, it's okay to kill children. They're just small. It's like, Pedro, what are you talking about? It's like when people really don't even have a grasp on simple, basic morality. Like, I'm not the most moral person ever. I'm not some, like, saint of morality. But there are, there is some that you just know is wrong, Jeffrey. Jesus. Or you should know is wrong. No. A note on sources. Epstein's day job took him all over the world. He owns private aircraft, airstrips, and real estate across Europe and the USA and its territories, and would spend his time scouring the world for investment opportunities. His passion project, though, was recruiting, grooming, sexual abuse, and the rape of young girls at an average rate of three per day. What the actual f***? I had no idea he was so prolific. I think Jeffrey Epstein's one of those things, it's like, well, I don't... It's like I feel with this podcast, it's like I don't really like these things. They're generally unpleasant. And so why would I naturally expose myself to this? But it's like I haven't read a ton about Jeffrey Epstein because I'm like, well, he's a horrible person. I don't want to read about all the nasty sh** that he got up to. Three a day blows my mind, you f***ing sicko. Activity at this level of intensity obviously requires an industrial scale operation to service it, and the sheer scale of it, as well as the high profile of some of the people involved, means that there's a whole bunch of misinformation and disinformation out there, so we just need to make a quick note about sources. First up, the main sources used for this are victim testimonies, legal documents, and investigative reporting. Victim testimonies are taken from the handful of victims who've chosen to go public, but some information is also taken from anonymized statements and depositions included in the Florida indictment, the Virgin Islands DOJ complaints, various civil suits, and Palm Beach police interviews. The legal documents are the NY Southern District indictments, the Virgin Islands DOJ civil complaint, the Maxwell depositions, and other depositions unsealed through civil actions against either Epstein or his estate, and various civil complaints filed in several U.S. jurisdictions jurisdictions, particularly those alleging Epstein's infamous Florida plea deal was unlawful, and it was. Oh my god, <laughs> one thing Jeffrey Epstein had a lot going on before he died, he had a lot of lawsuits. The main reporting comes from the Miami Herald, especially Julie K. Brown, who deserves much of the credit for finally ending Epstein's run, more on that later, and a variety of tabloids who brought victim stories and churned out accounts of court proceedings as the hearings went on. As well as this, there's a number of hit pieces, puff pieces, and highbrow intimate profiles on Epstein of the kind that occasionally get done by broadsheets and snobby magazines. Sources and avenues include anyone with a whiff of tinfoil hat. This isn't just prejudice, the fact is there's no need to turn to these people. Sticking with sworn, authoritative, and credible sources uncovers an actual, provable conspiracy and strongly suggests another one involving some of the world's most powerful people. Oh, I'm getting excited now. This is going to be intense. There's no need to go off the reservation to explore the potential involvement of people like Prince Andrew or Alan Dershowitz, or the extent to which the US establishment, including law enforcement agencies, either turned a blind eye or were complicit in Epstein's offending. It's pretty clear, actually, that an operation of this size couldn't have survived without at least the tacit consent of a big chunk of the top end of society, and mainstream sources reflect this reality. So don't get buttered if we don't entertain the idea that corporate and Hollywood elites were using Epstein to harvest the blood of children for satanic sacrifices. The actual picture is bad enough, and we won't be shying away from it. Yet, yeah, this is like, we don't, why do we need to say that he's doing satanic sacrifices? The sh that he got up to is totally wild. If it was less, you know, obvious, and there was settlements reaching stuff with like Prince Andrew and sh 
if that wasn't so, people would be like that's a conspiracy theory i'd be like i don't believe it it's prince it's the queen's son are you insane and never do it, what he it, he's got so much to lose he put would put shame on his whole family that's crazy and then it's like no 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 turns out <laughs> oh my god the queen's son <laughs> absolutely mad you don't need all the extra crazy shit. it's already crazy in fact, the reality of Epstein is possibly a clue as to where some of the ideas of QAnon actually come from. The kernel of truth within the construction of myth, so to speak. Other sources I've excluded are partisan. We will talk about Bill Clinton and Donald Trump as they're an important part of this story, but I've excluded opinion merchants and political operatives who obscure and elide facts to exaggerate or downplay the involvement of prominent Democrats or Republicans. The reason for this is simply their selective facts and outright lies just cause confusion. And finally, for boring legal reasons, it's important to say that Epstein's first conviction was laughable, and as he died before he could face the second batch of charges, some of this material constitutes the sworn allegations of plaintiffs and witnesses in various cases and may not be covered by the guilty verdict returned in the Jelaine Maxwell case. I've got a pronunciation guide for Jelaine Maxwell. I thought it was Gislaine. Let's just go with Jelaine because I'm assuming Chris actually looked into this and I've just like heard it wrong. Doesn't matter. But even though there's no comprehensive Epstein conviction, the Epstein estate has set up a fund to compensate victims, and there's little to no denial of the stated facts of the case, which saves Simon having to put 700 allegedly in front of statements that we're pretty sure are true but have not been proven. Yes, important legal disclaimer. I'm probably going to throw in a bunch of allegedly's anyway. <laughs> Just because it's a, it's a powerful people with lots of money. Perversion Inc. Now let's imagine you're a middle school girl, generally as happy as any teenage girl can be, and living an ordinary life. Or perhaps you're at the start of an extraordinary life, as so far in your short career on Earth, you're a straight-A student and a cheerleader and generally a popular person. If you've ever been in contact with the American secondary school system, you'll know just how difficult a combination that is to achieve. In your life to date, the only real cloud on the horizon has been money. Your family is far from wealthy, and one problem you're currently casting around trying to solve is how you're going to be able to afford presents for your parents with Christmas only a few days away. You're sitting in class one day when a friend passes you a note saying that if you're willing to go to a big house in Palm Beach, you'll be paid hundreds of dollars just to give an old guy a massage. It sounds simple enough, and as one of your relatives is a masseuse, you think you've got a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like. It might be a bit, bit gross, but it's easy money, and it shouldn't take too long, so you go. You get to the massive mansion in El Brio, and a bronze woman named Sarah Kellen meets you and takes you to a bedroom, which is disturbing, but the house is enormous, and there's pictures of the owner with Bill Clinton and the Pope and all other kinds of famous people, so surely... It can't be that bad. Lying face down on the bed, wearing nothing but a towel, is a silver-haired 51-year-old. He tells you you're beautiful and grabs your hip, moving you around so that he can look at you. That is... Oh, this is just so gross. What's the age of someone in middle school? Like a teenager? I don't know how old that is. But it's not... It's not... Oh, it, dude. He instructs you to strip down to your underwear and deliver the massage. It's a decision point you're not very well equipped to deal with at 14 years of age. Well, there we go. This is some f***ed up shit, my dude. You're alone in a room with a clearly rich and powerful man. You're unsure of where you are in the massive house and unsure of exactly where in Palm Beach you are as you arrived by taxi. There was armed security everywhere and the house is fenced and gated and you're not sure if the man on the bed has a weapon somewhere either. So, you freeze up and acquiesce to the abuse, letting him fondle your breasts and genitals while he masturbates under the towel. And when it's over, he gives you $200 and tells you to come back sometime, or if you're not comfortable, that you can bring him other girls and you'll still be paid. This is already horrible. And I know it's going to get worse. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Within a few years, because you need money for school shoes, for uniforms, textbooks, food, and because you feel so dirtied by what you've done, you can't really see yourself working a normal job or living a normal life ever again. You've recruited up to 70 girls for this man and have been abused by him for years. You're hooked on drugs, which he helps to get you, but pretty soon you're too old for him. You're not yet 21, and you lose access to younger girls, and the money starts drying up. Unable to keep your life together without the cash that you've become so dependent on, you end up in jail on drugs related charges. Your promising life is ruined, and all you've got to show for it is a felony criminal record and a head full of appalling memories and guilt. Such is the story 
of Courtney Wilde, one of the very few Epstein victims who was brave enough to come out and tell her story publicly. You'll be pleased to know that Courtney is doing well these days. She's a human rights and victims advocate, and the lawsuit she filed in 2008 alleging that Epstein's first plea deal was unlawful was successful, which means it's possible, and certainly something I like to think, that some of Courtney's extraordinary potential has been fulfilled. Not all of Epstein's victims were this lucky, though. One was found dead in a motel room from a heroin overdose, leaving behind a young son, and who knows how many unknown victims have taken their lives well before this vile enterprise was finally exposed. Given that the numbers that this seem to be operating at, and the scale of it, it's not nice to think about, is it? And however well Courtney's doing today, and however much it's pointed out that she's not at all at fault here, she's still got to live with what happened to her, and with what she did, as she herself points out. Courtney's story is nearly identical to all the other victims we know of. Epstein didn't usually use force, preferring to sweet talk and groom his victims, counseling them on their schooling and offering to help get them into modeling or the fashion industry or whatever else they were after. Some of the girls were made to engage in sex with both Epstein and a woman called Nadia Matsinkova, who Epstein would also claim that had bought as a sex slave from her mother in Yugoslavia. Why would you claim that? What's wrong with you? Don't claim your crimes. That's a bad idea. Marcinkova would use sex toys and strap-ons to have intercourse with some of the victims under the detailed direction of Epstein. More typically, Epstein would touch them or apply vibrators to the victim's genitals while they touched him and he masturbated. He would pay premium for oral sex or intercourse and would constantly be pushing them to agree to those. One victim, who was also victimized by Marcinkova, said that she refused to have intercourse with Epstein, but on one occasion, he pinned her to the massage table and raped her. After this, he apologized and gave her $1,000 and a car. There are also allegations, particularly from Virginia Roberts, that Jelaine Maxwell, Epstein's one-time girlfriend and long-time property manager, also participated in sex in a similar way to Marcin Kova. Maxwell, whose life and highly disreputable father could make a video all on its own, was convicted of multiple sex trafficking offenders on the strength of these and other accusations. It seems to be Maxwell who came up with the idea of using girls to recruit other girls. It seems that earlier on, Epstein staff would scout high schools and shopping malls for likely victims, a laborious and unreliable system. It's amazing. Like, we've talked about in previous episodes how you shouldn't involve other people with your crimes because the more people you involve in your crimes, the more likely one of them is to tell on you. But it just speaks to Epstein's power and money that he has all of these people doing all of this stuff and no one is coming forward. It's crazy. Setting up what the Palm Beach Police Department called a sex abuse pyramid scheme basically supercharged Epstein's supply chain. On top of this, victims were trafficked both to and from the Virgin Islands, a U.S. territory in the Caribbean. Additionally, Epstein had financed a modeling agency called MC2, founded by Jean-Luc Brunel, a model scout who had multiple allegations of sexual abuse outstanding against him. Brunel would, according to sworn statements by MC2 staff, procure girls as young as 13 from Europe and send them on various assignments, including to Epstein, where they were abused. Epstein's relationship with these girls was complicated, not on their part, of course, they were all victims, but his grooming behavior seems to indicate that somewhere in his own twisted mind, he thought they were all his girlfriends and that he was some kind of Hugh Hefner-style playboy. I think I'm going to be sick. For those who regularly came back to him, lured by cash or habituated to abuse or both, Epstein would get involved in their lives. A search of one of his properties found a school report card and he'd ordered one of his staff to send a bunch of flowers to one girl to congratulate her on her appearance in a high school performance. A couple of victims interviewed by police claimed they were in love with him, a sure sign of manipulative grooming on Epstein's part. This, coupled with his overfamiliar conduct at the Dalton School, seemed to suggest an interesting deformation of Epstein's character, a sort of Peter Pan syndrome, which chimes in well with the many descriptions of him as a fantasist and overall strange person. He's just an old poop. Yeah, another way you could describe him is being a dirty paedophile. Peter Pan syndrome. I mean, that's when people think they, 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 they're like always children in their minds. It's not a f***ing excuse. The main hubs of what the Virgin Islands DOJ called the Epstein Enterprise were in New York, Palm Beach, Florida, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. As already mentioned, Epstein had Manhattan's largest single residential property, where Prince Andrew notoriously chose to stay just after the Epstein indictment. The New York residence seems to be one of the two places Epstein did most of his entertaining, as well as a significant amount 
of child sex abuse. It's an open question as to whether any of his New York guests participated in the abuse part. But the damning by association, combined with clear and categorical statements by the likes of Virginia Roberts, very strongly suggests that at least some of them did. Prince Andrew, for example, settled with Virginia Roberts for millions of pounds to settle a civil suit in which she claims she was basically pimped out to the role for sex. Prince Andrew denies the charges, saying he was at Pizza Express, and also that he couldn't sweat at the time because he got PTSD in the Falklands War, so Virginia Roberts' account of him sweating and grunting over her can't be true. For legal reasons, we have to say that there's no evidence Prince Andrew engaged in sex with Virginia Roberts or any other victim of Epstein's, though it's difficult to say this without thinking about that photograph of the prince with his arm around Virginia's waist. The mansion on the island of Palm Beach, an ultra-affluent community in Florida where, incidentally, Donald Trump has his famous club, was where Epstein seems to have been based, despite having a registered residential address in a yacht club in the Caribbean. Virginia Roberts, whose name was Virginia Jufre at the time, worked at Trump's Mar-a-Lago when she was recruited as one of Epstein's victims. Palm Beach police uncovered in excess of 100 victims across a limited time span, so it seems that most of the industrialized child sexual abuse was happening here, though it's hard to know for sure. The Virgin Islands seems to have seen quite a lot as well, with, with Epstein's Island nicknamed Pedophile Island by locals. Epstein owns two of the Virgin Islands, Little St. James and Great St. James. As the names imply, these are adjacent to each other. Little St. James is where Epstein's infamous compound was, and Great St. James was purchased by Epstein through service and holding companies as a way to make his activities on Little St. James harder to surveil and monitor. This because Epstein was a registered sex offender at the time and subject to routine monitoring by law enforcement, monitoring which he made virtually impossible by claiming that the jetty on Little St. James was his front door and that law enforcement officers couldn't go beyond it without his permission, and also by making any access to Great St. James, which would have provided an excellent staging and observation post for surveillance of Epstein's compound, almost impossible for law enforcement. The fact is, too, that the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Justice, as motivated and dedicated as they are, couldn't really compete with Epstein's resources. Even according to their own civil complaint, Epstein was so wealthy, he basically outgunned their enforcement mechanisms. Wait, isn't it a territory of the United States? Don't they basically have unlimited money? You know, no matter how rich Jeffrey Epstein was, this is the US government. Get your shit together. Get some spy satellites or something. It's probably unrealistic to have spy satellites, isn't it? But come on. Maybe a boat. Maybe a sneaky boat. What about a little submarine with a periscope? We're familiar with the basic mechanics of the operation. Epstein would use his own staff, his weird girlfriend, not girlfriend, Jelaine Maxwell, and his victims to scout for girls between the ages of 13 and 16. The Virgin Islands complaint states that he trafficked girls as young as 11. But this isn't a proven allegation, and even if true, which does seem possibly likely, it's probably an anomaly. Epstein's predations were so consistent, and he was so blatant about his preferences, it's pretty easy to put him in a category which isn't that interested in girls of that age. What he was interested in, however, was 13 to 16 year old girls who looked younger, so it's possible that his procurement mechanisms might occasionally snare an actually younger victim. He tended to target disadvantaged or otherwise marginalized girls, a classic predator move, probably as they tended to be less supervised and, more importantly, less socially powerful and therefore less capable of bringing credible complaints against him. In terms of the sort of precautions one could expect from someone running an illegal enterprise, there were practically none. Epstein openly kept contact details of his underage victims in his various address books, including notations which indicated when they could be called and what for. This is weird. Like, he's so careful that he buys an island next to his island so that no one can spy on his island. But he's like, no, I'll just write down the names of my victims in a book. What are you up to? You're writing down your crimes, but you're also buying islands out of caution. It's very strange. He took photographs of his victims either naked, having sex with him, or with Nadia Masinkova, and displayed them around his house. That's f***ed up, dude. I mean, all of this is super f***ed up, but what are you up to? He talked to people about it, even people like Michael Wolf, a journalist notorious for writing tell-all exposés about prominent people. <laughs> Don't brag about your crimes to prominent journalists. According to Wolf, Epstein told him he liked young girls, to which Wolf replied that it might be better if he used the phrase young women. Might be better 
if you weren't a pedophile. Even Donald Trump seems to have known about it, saying when asked about Epstein that he was a terrific guy who loved ladies on the younger side. Oh, Trump. At a dinner party once, Epstein floated the idea of using his ranch in New Mexico as a sort of baby farm by stocking it with young women and inseminating them with his DNA. Holy shit. I'm assuming this has got to be out of anyone else's mouth. It's a joke, a weird, distasteful joke. Out of Jeffrey Epstein's mouth, it's like, you f***ing sicko. As we said before, Epstein was a mysterious figure, even to those closest to him, but pretty much the only thing people knew about him was that he liked young girls. So, how in the hell did he get away with it for so long? Bloody good question, Chris. Especially when the only precaution he and his co-conspirators seemed to have taken was to occasionally tell victims to say they were 18. One answer might be the classic, it was a different time. But another might be the people around him had an interest in in protecting him. Yeah, it wasn't that much of a different time. Being a pedophile was still being a pedophile, wasn't it? He's just super rich and powerful. And he's protecting himself. He's He's got such good protection that he's okay with being blasé about it and putting pictures around his house and writing his victims down in a sick notebook. Epstein is generally described as a financier, which basically means he would provide people with capital either directly himself or through connections. This capital could be for starting up businesses, as in the case of MC2 modeling, or for debt relief, as with the £24,000 he provided to Prince Andrew and Princess Sarah so that they could pay off their creditors. <laughs> £24,000? What are you up to? You're the Queen's son. £24,000 is not a lot. I mean, it's... £24,000 to a regular person is to a lot, a lot of money. £24,000 to a rich person is not a lot of money in any way. To Jeffrey Epstein, it's nothing. I assume to Prince, I would assume to Prince Andrew it's also nothing. Or it could be used as simple investment, buying stakes in businesses as a means of generating passive income, or buying property or other assets either for the same reason, or as a means of parking wealth. So far, so humdrum. I mean, from a certain point of view, if you own shares in anything, you could probably call yourself a financier. But, as a powerful money man, Epstein knew where all the bodies were buried. He knew where the money was, and perhaps more importantly, exactly where it had come from. He knew details about people's personal and business assets, which gave him important insights into their lives, and especially those aspects of their lives that they'd rather not have made public. Well, yes, for all the powerful people surrounding him, who I'm sure have, like, I don't know, whatever rich money people have. But, like... For the victims, they're not rich and powerful. The police are not rich and powerful. The justice people at the Justice Department are powerful, but they're not rich. They probably don't have some horrible secret that Jeffrey can hold over them. We don't know that. So, but I don't understand why how those people are being. I mean, obviously there's the victim stuff. You know, you you can be bullied into it, but there are so many. It's fascinating. He knew the sensitive tax arrangements of his billionaire clients and apparently a fair amount of dirt about Bear Stearns, but more on that later. So, but Bear Stearns is a company, of course they have dirt, They're a, or they were a giant merchant bank. It's like every few years it seems like, ah oh, yeah, this giant bank was just laundering money for terrorists. Yeah, 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 no, they were providing money to drug cartels. It's like, holy shit, we don't, we already expect big banks to be pieces of shit. So when you read these things, it's not like, oh my God, Bear Stearns? No. What? It's always like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> So, both literally and figuratively, Epstein's day job potentially gave him a large amount of leverage. Added to this, he was also something of a lion hunter, meaning that he liked to collect wealthy, powerful, and distinguished friends. And not just in America. Jelaine Maxwell, British socialite and daughter of notorious newspaper man and terrible swimmer Robert Maxwell, was able to connect him to European elites up to and including royalty. So, Epstein was able to collect connections with the commercial, cultural, and political establishment at the highest levels of both sides of the pond okay so i see how this could work like this is how he could potentially have people in government and you know prosecutors and stuff under his thumb not by having something on them but having something on their boss or just befriending them which seems like that shouldn't be possible like <laughs> if you're like the attorney general of some state or whatever it's like you find out that your mate is a criminal you can't just be like nah it's cool john's a great guy You've got to be like, John, we got to have a talk, mate. <laughs> Just a heads up, on Monday, knock knock FBI. Just saying.
you probably shouldn't even do that because you'll go on the run <laughs> but i like to think these people do have some sort of is this one of these things where everyone's going to comment in the comments about how f naive i am because i feel like these people should be held they are i don't know i watched billions that chuck rhodes character he's not being bought he's he's already rich but god damn it why do why does it have to be like this maybe it's what god intended all along and collect is exactly the word he used to describe his social activities in this sphere if you were a high flyer in society a talented celebrity or a powerful politician or businessman epstein was interested in schmoozing you the fact of him knowing ex-presidents and international luminaries also added to his untouchability it was through these connections that he was able to hire the kind of legal team oj could have only dreamed of some of them had worked for oj one of them had been special envoy to north korea and another was alan dershowitz the grand old man of u.s law also in his team ironically was kenneth Starr. The lawyer who led the impeachment of bill clinton for sexual misconduct in the white house he was also able to hire an army of private investigators he'd routinely used to coerce and intimidate witnesses plaintiffs and even law enforcement oh my god okay so that's how he does it it's like yeah obviously the big people have something to hide and jeffrey knows all of their like all of their skeletons but he would also use private investigators to dig up like regular small people stuff and be like oh this is so intense it's money is crazy so much money must have been going into this to keep it all secret it's crazy to see all of this in action as well as the breathtaking dereliction of duty on the parts of florida state authorities let's have a look at the investigators who brought epstein down the long and feeble arm of the law in 2005 a disturbance broke out in a classroom at a school for troubled youths in palm beach one of the girls had been found to have 300 dollars in cash in her purse more than a week's wages and a princely sum for the mostly disadvantaged students the girl was weeping and her classmates were variously cheering or calling her a whore when questioned she confessed to have gotten the money by providing a massage to some old guy in a mansion her stepmother put in a frantic call to detective michael pagan of the town of palm beach police department saying she had reason to believe her 14 year old stepdaughter had been abused she was so distraught that she didn't even leave a number for them to call her back on but police tracked her down and the girl was brought in for an interview she told them a tale of sexual activity with a creepy old silver-haired guy called jeff nobody knows how police made the connection but one suspects it might be that some people already basically knew what was happening and who was doing it yeah there's so many people someone be like oh jeff yes yeah, jeff in palm beach jeff epstein yeah we knew this day was coming in any event they conducted a photo lineup and she identified jeffrey epstein before opening a major investigation police went to the office of the u.s attorney for the southern district of florida this step is usually taken to determine whether there's sufficient or prima facie evidence to merit the expenditure of resources required to conduct the inquiry why do i get the feeling that that guy is going to be jeff's mate and is going to be like nah we didn't have the money for that i don't think this is important enough to follow up the abuse of a 14 year old girl we don't need to look into that do we boys do we do we well i'm in charge so no i mean i'm just speculating i don't know what the next line is going to be but that feels about right doesn't it the u.s attorney had never heard of jeffrey epstein hey but approved the police force's intention to throw the book at the child abuse and potentially get him a life sentence F***ing legend i was wrong my guess was wrong and i'm so happy they began their investigation and contrary to what casual criminalist listeners and viewers might expect it was absolutely stellar or what simon might expect this is amazing in their first sweep they found more than 50 victims and all of them told pretty much the same story lead detective joseph ricari reflected on what a strong case they built they had handwritten phone messages from the girls recovered from epstein's garbage they had flight logs and call logs which matched exactly with victim testimony and the days they were scheduled to give massages police chief michael reiter commented on the absolute mountain of witness testimony they had and to quote this was not a he said she said situation this was 50 something she's and one he and the she's all basically told the same story it's like one of those things you know with uh like me too it's like when there are eight women and they are all saying the same thing it's kind of hard to be like wow well, you at that point can you still really deny it like are they all out to get you are they all saying the same thing just by coincidence <laughs> it's like come on and there's 50 of them but why do i still get the feeling that this isn't the big slam dunk that ends this investigation i get the feeling there's someone higher up who's going to kill this real hard and that is insane 
given how hard given how intense this evidence is in fact i can almost not believe it i'm really inclined to believe that this must be the thing that gets him caught because it would be insane for it to be otherwise girls who had never met each other dozens of them were giving nearly identical accounts of what happened to them even down to descriptions of epstein's genitalia which is why i now know that his penis was mushroom shaped and i really wish i didn't you have what's been described as an egg-shaped penis mm. yeah thanks chris now i've got that in my mind as well couldn't we just have left it with his genitalia did we have to go there his research is impeccable everything seemed to be coming up roses police had more than enough to lock epstein up for life and because the investigation had uncovered who the guy really was his jet-setting lifestyle and suspicions that powerful and wealthy people might be involved in what was potentially an international sex trafficking ring the fbi was conducting a grand jury inquiry at the same time you gotta be like oh if you're you're jerry you're gonna be like oh shit. I'm in big trouble. Or maybe he's like, no, I got friends who'll take care of this. Psycho. Unfortunately, the investigation and uncovered who Epstein really was and the wealthy and powerful people connected to him, which began to prove a bit daunting for U.S. attorney Alexander Acosta. According to Detective Ricari, Acosta became increasingly lukewarm on the case and started putting pressure on the department to wrap things up. Oh my god, and it begins. And despite an overwhelming pile of evidence warranting a wide ranging and comprehensive prosecution, Acosta and it started negotiating a plea deal. Are you shitting me? A plea deal for what? He abused 50 people at a minimum. That's 50 people who came forward. What are we doing? This is power, guys. This is power. This is inexplicable point number one. It's not inexplicable, it's the result of money and power. After Epstein's arrest and searches of his properties and planes, one of which had a bed in it and was nicknamed the Lolita Express, a mountain of physical evidence was added to the already formidable pile of testimony, corroborating records, and high-value circumstantial evidence. It's really difficult to understand why a deal was even on the table. Any U.S. attorney eager for advancement should have been slathering for the chance to trumpet this case in court. A case like this was likely to be a slam dunk, ratings extravaganza and the sort of career stepping stone ambitious prosecutors absolutely dream of so why then did acosta schedule a breakfast meeting with attorney jay lefkowitz 70 miles away from his own office the customary place to negotiate deals in the west palm beach marriott i assume that's sarcasm <laughs> why would you have a meeting 70 miles away from your office it's like two hours drive what are you up to Perhaps the informal setting had something to do with the fact that Lefkowitz and DaCosta had been past colleagues at Kirkland and Ellis, a high-profile Washington practice. Oh my god, this... Ah, it begins! It begin. It's so crazy! There is no... Some people just see... are above the law! This is mental! Perhaps Lefkowitz, who'd been special envoy to North Korea, was just too busy to schlep it out to the U.S. Attorney's Office like every other lawyer negotiating a plea deal, or perhaps the Marriott served a special sort of breakfast especially conductive to productive in negotiations. Whatever the reason, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Florida, Alexander Acosta, struck a deal with the attorney for Jeffrey Epstein, J. Lefkowitz, by the time breakfast was done. This account, painstakingly researched and reconstructed by the Miami Herald, has since been denied by Acosta and the DOJ for formally ruled he was telling the truth but where and when the deal was cut isn't as important as what was in it and what a deal it was epstein would cop to a grand total of three state felony charges two state charges of soliciting prostitution and one for having sex with a minor as well as registering as a sex offender the minor in question who was 14 years old at the time of offending was labeled a child prostitute and actually threatened with prosecution which is ludicrous florida did at the time have some old statutes which defined child prostitution as a crime in which a child could be charged but it had been long superseded by various state and federal acts so that in reality child prostitutes in the sense of children guilty of prostitution didn't really exist in u.s law as they shouldn't be because that's called a victim what the f the past but the use of this superseded bit of statute meant that epstein wouldn't be prosecuted on the more serious federal charge which was child sex trafficking which carried a potential life sentence it's insane like what is he's fa facing realistically a life sentence in prison for this and i don't know what he gets away with but i have vague memories that it is very very little jail time if any which if he walks that is absolutely 
in i've said insane so many times in this episode but that would just be mind-blowing he would also pay restitution to the 36 victims identified in the FBI probe, a mere fraction of his actual victims. On top of this, Epstein would serve 13 months in a county jail. 13 months. A year and a month for 50 victims. This was unusual as well for state convictions. The guilty party would ordinarily go to state prison. This state prison system in Florida is pretty rough, and it's likely that Epstein, going in as a convicted child abuser, might not come back out. Or at least not in one piece oh no whether or not this was a consideration we don't know but the fact is that for state charges people generally go to state prison it's quite strange he was sent to county and if nothing else it's another sign of the sweetheart treatment he was given by authorities for a range of offenses which really should have taken any kind of consideration off the table in any event the deal was cut over 2007 and 2008 and it's noted in the records that epstein provided quote valuable consideration for information given to federal investigators what the f does that mean this is apparently cited as the reason for leniency of his sentence what information he gave isn't known and given how many skeletons he knew the whereabouts of it could have been almost anything but it is a bit of a coincidence that the gfc was happening around this time and that epstein cited as a witness in a federal case against some bear stearns executives who oversaw big chunks of the massive mess which was the collapse of the subprime mortgage market well, obviously, that information didn't go very far because one thing about the great financial crisis is like, did anyone really pay the price of that? Was anyone who was up to that dodgy dealing and securitization and all that? Shit, did anyone actually get punished? Wasn't there like one scapegoat dude and that was it? So it didn't really go anywhere, did it? Which leaves open the possibility Epstein was informing on another matter entirely, or his testimony was used as part of the pretext for his unbelievably light sentence. It sounds like someone's pressing some buttons upstairs and just using this as an excuse for why he got a year and a month in jail for the abuse of 50 children <laughs> crazy but the two most outrageous aspects of this deal were the fact that it was sealed into the so-called non-prosecution agreement first of all the details of the deal as well as the fact that it existed at all was kept secret from the plaintiffs and their lawyers not only is this highly unusual it's actually unlawful so the judge found in courtney wilde's case and since then courtney's law the bill she championed has made it even more illegal so to speak not just the law but common sense and any sort of notion of natural justice make it necessary to inform the victims if the accused has received a plea deal but the upshot of keeping this one dark was that on the day the deal was formalized in court not a single plaintiff was present to object to it or to see epstein sentenced as none of them knew it was happening also somewhat strangely a retired judge was substituted for the regular one on this particular day another aspect of the case which has never been satisfactorily explained the most popular theories are that the regular judge was disgusted enough to simply refuse to ratify the deal or the powerful forces maneuvered a judge they knew would give the right ruling into the court specifically for that purpose <laughs> Jesus, allegedly. <laughs> this is just speculation. Yes, thank you, Chris. Jesus. The fact is that this is a strange thing that happens, and we've no idea why. But by far the most egregious aspect is the non prosecution agreement. At first glance, it might not seem so exceptional in granting immunity to co conspirators in exchange for a guilty plea. This does happen from time to time. But the language of this one is to every lawyer and legal expert who's seen it utterly baffling and it's pretty clear they're only using words like inexplicable and baffling because lawyers aren't generally comfortable with th calling things criminal or sinister and we would never call things like that we'll just agree with the lawyers and say that it's uh, baffling other people might call it sinister and criminal definitely not us at the casual criminalist allegedly what the provision includes is immunity from federal prosecution not only for epstein's four co-conspirators but also for every other co-conspirator or potential co-conspirator named and unnamed that is sweeping and uncertain guys which is what you don't want laws to be what this essentially means is that anybody at all who might have been involved in epstein's offending people who'd accepted offers of girls which his accusers categorically state happened frequently people who'd done logistics or transport or basically anyone else who had anything to do with epstein's industrial scale international child sex ring would basically get off scot free and further to that the fbi's grand jury inquiry into powerful people who might have been involved in this intentional child sex ring would also be shut down because anyone they might be investigating would by virtue of this deal become immune to prosecution by federal authorities so 
To sum up, the U.S. attorney, Alex Acosta, agreed to a deal which ensured that the scope and range of Epstein's offending would never be found out, that anyone who'd been involved with him would be protected, that the victims would have not only no opportunity to object, but would be effectively silenced, and the offender himself would get a slap on the wrist. Which isn't really anyone's interpretation of fearless advocacy on behalf of the people of the United States, except possibly and allegedly Alex Acosta's. Now, there's a lot of theory and speculation about how and why a deal like this would ever be cut. And this is one of those weird occasions when I'm simultaneously agreeing and disagreeing with various conspiracy theorists out there. Most of them say that stuff like this is normal, par for the course, and that all government is like this. I've worked for and in government, and I happen to know it's not. This is an exception, a shocking, startling, and outrageous exception. Yeah, I agree. Like, this is some... The reason that we are and i assume you dear listener are so shocked by this is because it is unusual if this stuff was happening all the time we wouldn't be so shocked and appalled by it we'd be like oh yeah par for the course but we're not we're shocked and alarmed and this stuff's generally pretty public record if something's been sealed you obviously can't see what's in the sealed thing but you know it's been sealed and you know it's weird and you know he's only gone to prison for 13 months despite all of this stuff if this was happening all the time well i i I think we'd know again am i just being naive i know the conspiracy theory people are going to call me naive i i agree with chris i don't think this is regular par for the course It's not unique by any means. I can think of three cases at the top of my head, two American and one British, where people in positions similar to Epstein have either mysteriously died, vanished, or sailed off into the blue yonder with pockets full and a new name. But it is far from usual. Where I find myself agreeing with the conspiracy types is in their contention that there's some kind of conspiracy of silence going on here. Julie K. Brown, the dauntless Miami Herald reporter who cracked this case wide open, was able to obtain communications between the prosecutors and Epstein's lawyers. These revealed, in her own words, quote, an unusual level of collaboration between federal prosecutors and Epstein's legal team that even government lawyers in recent court documents admitted was unorthodox. In an interview given to NPR, Brown expanded on this, saying that she never had seen a case like this before, where federal prosecutors seemed to be working with the defendants against the accusers. The reasons for this do seem pretty obvious, even if they can't be proven to be true. High-profile business tycoons, shady and otherwise, celebrities, politicians, and even royalty are implicated in the case, and it's probable that the language granting immunity to any potential co-conspirators was designed to protect them. There's even a, and we'll point this out, a conspiracy theory that we are certainly not saying is true. It's a conspiracy theory that is out there that Alan Dershowitz, Harvard Law Professor and Ultimate Legal Heavyweight, got the language included to protect himself. Again, that is a conspiracy theory that you might choose to believe in or you might not. Alan Dershowitz strenuously denies this and all involvement in or knowledge of Epstein's offending and was able to get his own name stricken from the records of the relevant civil actions which accused or mentioned him, which tells us something but what we really couldn't say. I don't... Okay, so obviously I've even got a note here from Chris saying don't accuse this dude of anything um, because obviously he's gone to great legal lengths to remove his name from this. But I also think, like, if... If you are guilty, we're not saying is, again, like I, to remove this entirely from this situation. If a person is guilty of a crime and there is court proceedings against them somehow and they can get their name removed from that, they're going to do so. But if a person is completely innocent and they're also included in that, they're also going to go to great lengths to remove it. Possibly even greater lengths because they're actually innocent and they're like, what the f*** are you doing wrapping me up in this shit? If I was this dude and I was innocent, I'd do the exact same thing. I don't think it indicates dick. As for Acosta, he says that he was simply outlawed by the all-star bench that Epstein's unlimited funds allowed him to muster. To be fair, Epstein's defense was hugely aggressive. Not only were his heavy hit legal team all over the U.S. Attorney's Office, the accusers and their families, they hired a small army of private investigators. These people dug up dirt on the victims and their families, trawling through their social media accounts and criminal records. Many of the girls had understandably gone off the rails or were never properly on the rails in the first place. They put them and their families under physical surveillance as well. In one instance, tailing so aggressively, they ran one of the victim's parents off the road. They even paid visits to victims and their families, trying to coerce them into recanting their testimony through threats of dire consequences for going after such a powerful man. Yeah, 
And you can, I get this, like, if you're just a regular person living your regular life and suddenly all of this pressure is put upon you, that's got to be incredible. I mean, like, incredible almost sounds like a positive word. It's got to be incredibly scary. It's got to be like, you must seriously consider this. Because like, why am I doing this? This guy's going to crush me. He's so much more powerful than me. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. Now, you might think that this sort of behavior could constitute obstruction of justice, or at the very least, interfering in a police investigation, both of which are crimes. You'd be right, but astonishingly, nobody ever took any action to pursue these avenues, which emboldened the investigators so much that they started putting surveillance on the task force detectives and even the chief of police. This feels like an unnecessary risk. So possibly Acosta was simply outgunned and outclassed, but there's some things going against that, not least of which is the fact the prosecutors also threatened the victims. Remember that suspended statute about child prostitution? Multiple victims reported that prosecutors warned them they might be exposing themselves to criminal charges by testifying against Epstein, which is insane. These people are so clearly the victims. That isn't independently verified. Good that we're covering that, and Acosta denies this, but multiple victims make the claim. And like we say, it is just a claim, it is not proven, it's all allegedly make up your own mind. They would use ground tactics, hand to hand combat. And then there's the fact that an ambitious U.S. attorney whose reputation rests on him being an awesome lawyer presents as his excuse that he just wasn't good enough at lawyering. Again, you can be the best lawyer in the world, but when you are facing an army of other best lawyers in the world, that is still going to be intimidating. This is just my personal opinion, but if your excuse for something is to trash your reputation, then that says a lot in Chris's opinion. But of course, the DOJ found that Acosta wasn't hiding anything, that it simply exercised poor judgment in agreeing to the deal. It also found that the breakfast meeting hadn't been where the deal was cut and that their main consideration had been to prevent more trauma for the victims by avoiding a lengthy trial, which might seem plausible and didn't you consider the sheer scope of the offending uncovered by the Palm Beach police and the FBI. You know what, as a victim, I wouldn't be so worried about a trial, I'd be worried about the guy who has done this to me getting a slap on the wrist, which is the outcome here, which is insane. At which point it becomes absolutely ludicrous. Totally agree, Chris. But that's what the DOJ found, so I guess that's the end of it. Unless anyone else out there happens to be an investigative journalist and wants to do a bit of digging, that is. Epstein then went off to do his very little bit of time, and it's clear that his special treatment didn't end with the deal the U.S. attorney so obligingly gave him. Early in jail, he applied for day release, something sex offenders aren't really supposed to get, and was allowed to travel to a luxurious office that had set up near the prison pretty well every day. During this period, Epstein bought children's underwear right under the noses of the authorities. A childless sex offender allowed to leave prison every day and buy underpants, which wouldn't fit an adult woman, is appalling enough, but there's more. Oh, God. While there, he had full access to the internet and phones, and also had paid for a detail of sheriff's department officers to escort him and function as a security team for him. This is insanity. They would drive him to his office or even his home if he asked them to, and then sit outside, never coming in, just reading magazines, drinking coffee, and signing visitors in and out. Some of these visitors were not no, no, no. How is this? How? How is this? What is going on? This is one of the most insane miscarriages of justice that I've ever seen. Some of these visitors were young girls whom Epstein had called in for sex. When asked by the Miami Herald whether they'd ever questioned any of this or even inquired as to the nature and purpose of these visits for a registered sex offender accused of abusing young girls, no less, they simply replied that it wasn't their job. What is your job then exactly? So what we've got here is three levels of law enforcement. The town of Palm Beach Police Department, basically the city police, frankly and fearlessly attempted to do their jobs to the utmost of the ability. The sheriff's department, basically one level of government lower, allowed their officers to be hired out as bodyguards and chauffeurs for a prisoner. This isn't an unheard of arrangement. Most police can be hired for special duties by private citizens, closing off roads for film crews, or providing special protection, for example. But this one's very on the nose. And then, very on the nose, they are signing young girls into a man who is currently in prison for sex offending's house. Jesus. 
And then finally, and probably most egregiously, there's the federal prosecutors, the ones who are supposed to be the beacon of integrity in a justice system where local authorities are known to be more susceptible to corruption. The very authorities you go to when you suspect the lower levels of officialdom to be derelict in their duty or corrupt. These federal prosecutors committed a breathtaking dereliction of duty, at the very least defanging the city police investigators and basically allowing a situation where a serial sex offender on a massive scale was was able to do a life reset and continue offending even while he was meant to be serving the ridiculously tiny sentence that he had been given. It's very difficult not to conclude that the lightness of the sentence and the ludicrously liberal conditions under which it was served constituted a tacit approval of Epstein's behavior. I don't think it's a tacit approval of Epstein's behavior. I think it's just corruption, allegedly. The whole deal feels like frantic measures just to make the whole problem go away, as if the federal authorities involved were more worried about the embarrassment than they were committed to punishing something they truly thought was wrong. I say feels like because that's really what it does feel like, despite the fact that everyone involved, including Acosta, vehemently denies this. So I guess it's up to all of you to decide. Was Acosta outlawed by Epstein's team? Was he pressured by powerful groups or individuals? Or was he unbothered by the industrial scale abuse of poor people? I know what I think, and it's a combination of those three. I don't think again i don't want to jump to like people's defenses too hard but i also feel like you don't want to jump to accusations too hard this guy seems like he was just put under a ton of pressure by people more powerful than him i don't think he's like F poor people they deserve to be abused i think that's insane to say like people generally don't again people are going to call me like super naive in the comments but i don't think people generally go into the kind of job that he has uh i don't think they're bad people I think they probably believe in justice and stuff, and then they get beaten out the shit out of by people that are more powerful than them in this situation. Maybe. It's interesting, I have different opinions to Chris on some of this stuff. Miami Herald investigative reporter Julie K. Brown had been following the case and got wind of the plea deal. Like every other sane human or saw it, she was utterly mystified as to how such a thing could have happened without a serious dereliction of duty on the part of the authorities. So she and her photographer, Emily Mitchott, got to work. She and her team at the Herald managed to locate 60 victims out of 80 identified and began doggedly contacting them, hoping to find some who'd be willing to go on the record. As she says herself in her book Perversion of Justice, which is well worth a read, this was difficult and emotionally harrowing work. Not only was she deadly afraid of re-traumatizing these women, but there was also the fact that none of these people had any reason to trust any social institution ever again. I get that, I get that, but also, if you're, if the government and the police haven't helped you, I mean, I feel like journalists and reporters are the last beacon of, like, hope in a free society. It's why it's so important for, for newspapers to be free to publish what they want without fear of repercussion because these are the sort of people that will, who aren't money driven, who aren't afraid because I, I could never be a journalist. I'm way too afraid of, <laughs> of all of this stuff. Um, but there are these people who exist and they're like the heroes digging things out in these uh, when the rest of society has failed victims in my opinion. Man, I'm with you. They'd been betrayed in the worst conceivable way by the system and were likely to see the media, especially the mainstream media, as an element of that system which was just as rotten as the rest of it. Yeah, but there are investigative journalists. There are people, and they off they're, they're the people who win Pulitzer Prizes, who aren't the mainstream media, pumping out the 24-hour news cycle of bullshit. And my opinion of the media is not particularly high, but my opinion of, like, journalists within, you know, certain uh papers news organizations is super high like it's a it's interesting contradiction i'm just realizing mainstream media kind of bullshit. investigative journalism super important happily eight of them agreed to speak with her four of whom consented to giving video interviews she also began digging into the investigation and plea deal making contact with lead detective and absolute legend joseph ricari as well as ex-police chief michael Ryder. she was able to obtain the previously sealed police reports details of the plea deal and a host of other information which pointed to a miscarriage of justice on a truly biblical scale the amount of detail she was able to uncover was truly astonishing, and the fact that members of the Palm Beach PD cooperated with her is a heartening note in this story. It is. That feels good. And a testament to their dedication to obtaining justice for the victims. Julie describes Detective Ricari as salt of the earth, and a man who doesn't care who you are. If you've committed a crime, he's coming after you. 
She says he was absolutely furious with the plea deal and the fate of the case in general. Sadly, Joe Riccari died shortly after speaking to the Herald, so he never got to see Epstein's ultimate demise. That's a shame. Once she'd gathered all of her material, Julie published the first in a six-part series, also entitled Perversion of Justice, describing the extraordinary plea deal and recounting victim testimonies of Epstein's offending. In the offices of the Miami Herald, there's a board which shows the most read news stories of the day. She recalls the top story of that particular day was a piece about a woman who farted in a gas station, which is definitely the sort of article I'd click on immediately, so that's understandable. <laughs> oh my god, it's nice to have a little bit of levity. <laughs> Jesus. Even this relatively unfunny thing from Chris, I'm like, ah, oh, sweet relief. They're three days apart, so I'm guessing she didn't actually check her piece until it had been up for a little while. The actual story was about a woman who farted in a grocery store and then pulled a knife on a customer who called her out for it. Holy <laughs> sh- Did you fart? You shut your filthy mouth! <laughs> I found it, in case Jen wants to put it up. <laughs> There's a link, Jen, if you want to find this. Jen edits the videos. Did I might probably mention that at the beginning. Uh, you can put it on screen if you want to. A little extra bit of enjoyment for our video viewers. This comes out on YouTube as well as a, pod- as a podcast if you want to check that out. It's just as fun. Some might even say more fun. And you get to look at my wonderful face. <laughs> anyway, seeing her work at the bottom of the pile, she basically went about her business, as any good journalist does, once they've been put on a story. Once it's out there, it's time to live your life for a bit and then get into the next story. But pretty soon, her story absolutely blew up. Julie was charmingly surprised by this, but the fact is that it had all the elements of a blockbuster all along. The rich and famous, sex crimes, apparent or alleged or possible, running out of qualifying words here, perversion of the course of justice, it was the whole shebang. She recalls that when her story outstripped the farting woman piece, the whole newsroom applauded because while all journalists will do the clickbait stuff, because they have a crippling addiction to food and shelter, a good number of them still care about public interest reporting. Once the story came out, it rocked the establishment. This was a moment similar to the Boston Globe's reporting on the Catholic Church's child sex abuse cover-ups, which was made in that great movie. With, um... Why can I remember neither of the two super famous actors that are in this movie? (laughs) God damn, Simon, your memory is terrible. A story which literally changed the world. This is impressive as it dropped in 2018, a year when the entire news cycle was basically dominated by the Trump administration. In its favor, however, was the fact that this was the height of the Me Too movement. Harvey Weinstein and others had just recently been exposed as sex predators and the cultural moment was exactly right. And unlike other Me Too cases, this one wasn't about actors, celebrities or athletes, but was about the poor and the disadvantaged, proof that the culture of harassment and abuse stretched across the full spectrum of society. People were surprised by this. (laughs) People look at me too and be like, nah, 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 this is just happening with uh, uh, producers, directors, young actors. That's, uh, That's only where it's happening. Of course it's not. It's happening across the board, in every level of society. Just people care about it less when it's not famous rich people. Julie herself became an overnight celebrity, inundated with phone calls and emails, and has been the face of this story ever since. Though she's always quick to point out there's large teams that have nothing to do with her still working on this to this day. I like this Julie room. She sounds very modest, despite doing this incredible thing. More importantly, those victims who chose to speak out, both initially to Julie Brown and later, were finally getting the public hearing they deserved. Quite a few people came under the microscope as a result of Julie's reporting. Epstein, of course, and Alexander Acosta, architect of the 2008 plea deal and then Secretary of Labor under Donald Trump. Interestingly, Labor is one of the bigger departments in the U.S. federal government and human trafficking falls under its remit. Acosta resigned and began defending himself and figures who'd been associates of Epstein, including Prince Andrew, President Trump, President Clinton, Alan Dershowitz, and many others began fielding questions about whether they had been preying on young girls all this time. This was also around the time that people outside of the UK first started hearing about Jelaine Maxwell, architect of the Epstein Enterprise, when it first entered its full production phase. Other journalists, many of whom claim to have been stymied or obstructed in their inquiries either by Epstein's goons or allegedly their own editors, began belatedly publishing their own stories and serious scrutiny was applied to how sections of the media protect the evil and the corrupt, so long as they're also rich and powerful. But probably most importantly, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, a district famous for taking on tough high-profile cases, began the process which would finally see Epstein indicted on the correct federal charges and facing the correct potential penalty 
life imprisonment. We all know how this story ends. Epstein was arrested, returning from an international journey, one of many which he, incidentally, hadn't reported despite being required to as a registered sex offender. A new indictment was filed, an extremely broad and general, which covered the whole scope of his offending, as it was known to have occurred within the continental US, and Epstein was locked up at the Metropolitan Correctional Center, or MCC. Then, on August 10, 2019, Epstein was found dead in his cell. This devastated his victims, who had once again had their day in court cruelly snatched from them. Some would still get it, though, as the Southern District of New York simply shifted its prosecution to longtime Epstein associate Jelaine Maxwell. When Maxwell tried to cite the non prosecution provisions in the Acosta deal, the New York Southern District simply shrugged them off, arguing successfully that they weren't bound by the terms of that deal. This is probably bad news for the likes of Sarah Kellen and Nadia Masenkova. In any event, Maxwell went to trial, and some of Epstein's victims were finally able to accuse her and him of the crimes which had been committed against them. Maxwell was convicted on five counts relating to sexual trafficking and activity with minors and is due to be sentenced later in 2022. As of now, she's 60 odd, and the likely sentence is in the neighborhood of 40 years. The likeliest outcome is that she'll spend the rest of her life behind bars. This is something that's so intense, right? Like, when you are, you've been convicted, and it's like you're looking at all these years in prison, and then it's like, nah, we're going to sentence you in a few months. you got to be like, I mean, I guess she knows that it's going to be for the rest of her life, most likely. But that's got to be like, <laughs> like the, the, the Theranos trial's going on right now. She's guilty of these counts of stuff, and she's just waiting to be, to be sentenced. And she's young, though. So she, and it could be, it, the sentence could be small, it could be massive. That's got to be like, you've got to be biting your freaking nails on that one. Who else was involved? I said at the top that we weren't going to entertain the idea that Epstein was part of a global conspiracy to harvest the blood of abused children for satanic rituals, and we aren't. That's just madness. But what we are going to entertain is the idea behind the idea that the rich and powerful will coordinate and cooperate to take advantage of the poor and the powerless, or at the very least, connive at protecting each other from the consequences of their actions. This is something we know to be true, as we've seen it over and over again. As much as Western countries like to talk about being nations of laws, the fact is that this is only a relative statement. For the most part, and compared with dictatorships and banana republics, the law applies equally to all citizens at least in theory. Yeah, but I mean, come on. Like, better lawyers are going to get you a better deal. And better lawyers cost more money. But it is objectively true that the rich and powerful can and will circumvent legal penalties, organizing amongst their little clubs and finding ways to soften or avoid legal sanctions entirely. The most basic interpretation of Epstein's treatment throughout much of his life is just that. He was able to get away with it for so long and was so surprised when he was finally brought to account simply because there's one law for the rich and one law for the poor. This isn't technically true, but it does, in fact, often work out that way, especially when participation in the legal process is paid for by the hour. I don't think this Bill Cosby, it just came to me now, um, he recently got out on some technicality, didn't he? Which is mad. And it's like, whoever his lawyer is, he should be kissing that guy's shoes. And he should be also back in prison, <laughs> allegedly, in my opinion. Sorry, it just came to me right now as we were reading this. It mentioned it earlier. I couldn't think of the guy, Bill Cosby. This isn't technically true, but it does, in fact, often work out that way, especially when participation in the legal process is paid for by the hour. I don't think this entirely explains the first deal, however, and the fact of Epstein's final imprisonment actually stands as proof that our social institutions can work, eventually. The media, as represented by the Herald reporters, did their job by scrutinizing something fishy in government. When it was exposed, the full machinery of the state kicked in to correct what should have never been fumbled in the first place. There's almost certainly more to this than the effect of social inequality, though. What's truly disturbing about the Epstein case is the extent to which the world's elite was implicated in his wrongdoing. Epstein had many powerful friends, and he entertained them frequently in all of the places where he did most of his offending. On top of that, he was open about his tastes, even to the extent of displaying pictures of his victims, and many of these are given sworn statements to the effect that they were expected to have sex with Epstein's friends and associates. So was Epstein a pimp for the rich and famous? The problem here is that there's no evidence for it, in the sense that there's nothing we can point to as a smoking gun, at least not in any way which would pan out in a criminal court or protect us 
from libel action. This absence of evidence can, however, be construed as suspicious in itself, especially given how much of the investigation into Epstein remains under seal, despite the sterling efforts of investigative reporters around the world. What we do have is the accusations of people like Virginia Roberts, and it's definitely not just her, whom we know have been victimized by Epstein. We also have the flight logs from his private planes, phone records, and his digital address book, from which it's clear that very prominent people in business, entertainment, and politics were frequent visitors at his houses, his island, and his ranch. It's difficult to believe that they went to parties and for long visits at Epstein's properties and didn't notice all the young women hanging about. It's even unlikely that they didn't notice Epstein using these girls for sex three times a day. Michael Wolfe noticed girls in their late teens or early 20s forming a part of Epstein's entourage when they flew off to Palm Beach, and there are plenty of other accounts of his masseurs and of topless girls on swings or posing by the pool. When you put this together with the vagina soaps and naked pictures on the walls, the whole vibe must have felt like the last days of Sodom, and it strains credibility to breaking point to imagine these people didn't know what all of this meant. Knowing it was going on is different to being involved in it. As, uh, there's do you, it's morally complex do you have an obligation to report it morally yeah i'd say so it certainly did for the fbi who centered their whole investigation on the involvement of prominent members of the u.s establishment and were looking likely to seriously embarrass and even possibly even convict some of them until acosta's deal shut the whole thing down and in terms of the civil complaints and we need to tread carefully here some of those complaints dealing with epstein associates have been settled prince andrew's case is one worth looking at virginia roberts publicly accused him of raping her on three occasions in three different locations which he denied and for which she sued him. Andrew's lawyers tried everything in the book, attempting to get the whole complaint dismissed, refusing interviews with U.S. authorities, and trying to argue that her original $500,000 payout from Epstein indemnified him against any further litigation. When all these failed, Andrew's lawyers settled for what is reported to be $16 million U.S. dollars, but that is not confirmed. Just reported to be that. It's possible this settlement was undertaken merely to avoid further embarrassment of the royal family, but it's also plausible to think that nobody who's innocent, no matter how wealthy, will drop that much money on a case they think they'll win. Yeah, but you can you can also be innocent of something and still think you'll lose and settle. Happens all the time. Or agree to a sealed settlement and perpetual doubt about their guilt if they think there's a reasonable chance they'll be acquitted and vindicated before the entire world. The publication of Epstein's address book, another sordid episode in this sordid case, must have had some very powerful people getting very nervous indeed. They must have squirmed at the idea of their own personal details being mixed in with those underage girls and women whom Epstein would routinely call for sexual services. And they must have been hugely relieved when the butler who managed to scan it before Epstein could destroy it was jailed for trying to sell it to the highest bidder, a circumstance which meant that the contents weren't actually available at the height of the investigation into Epstein's network. Leland Nally, a writer for Mother Jones, undertook the Herculean task of calling everyone in the book. Oh my god, if this, this butler has made a tactical error. <laughs> if you have scanned that address book, you have an enormous amount of leverage over all of the people in that book and over the prosecution. How are you in prison? How did you end up in jail? Number one thing upon scanning that book I would do is encrypt it. It encrypt the shit out of it so no one can access it. I would not write down the password anywhere and I would hold it in my big brain. And then I would be like, I have the password to that book. Uh, I'm not going to prison. You want to know who's in that book? You want to be able to prosecute all those people? I am going to need blanket immunity right the f*** now. <laughs> You're testing me to see if I think like a sociopath. Get that signed up. I'll give you that password and you can carry on. And I'm going to go on my merry way. Thank you very much. The butler made a tactical error. Leela Nally, a writer for Mother Jones, undertook the Herculean task of calling everyone in the book. Of course, in a sample of more than 1,500 numbers, some were going to be wrong and some reallocated, but he did manage to talk with some of Epstein's oldest friends in amongst getting brushed off by the flunkies of the global elite. What emerges is a layered picture, where only a very few people seem to have known the full extent of what he and Jelaine Maxwell were doing. One of Epstein's oldest friends, a woman with no real public profile and therefore no expense 
events of asked to cover said that Epstein's MO was basically to track down rich or famous men and introduce them to a girl. He liked to have lots of girls around as a symbol of his power and his party time playboy image, and he'd use this to impress people. This chimes in with the notorious video of Donald Trump and Epstein ogling young women at a party. Wait, I haven't seen this infamous video, but of course it exists. But the majority of the people in Epstein's address book had only met him a couple of times at most, and a good number were astonished that they were in there at all. And those who knew Jelaine Maxwell said they thought the book looked a hell of a lot more like her address book than his. Also, hi, yeah, I'm doing an investigative report on Ep Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> eh, Jeffrey who? <laughs> who would be like, oh, yeah, 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 Jeff, my mate. Yeah, we're real close. No one's saying that. It seems the book was just another aspect of Epstein's collecting of prominent people, a sort of systematic social climbing powered by Jelaine Maxwell's connections to the aristocracy, which makes the idea of it as evidence of a global child abuse conspiracy amongst the one world oligarchy a little bit hard to swallow. What's more likely is that for most people involved with Epstein, ordinary, everyday sleaze was going on. And if they were paying to participate in that sleaze anywhere in the US, then in a just world, they'd be prosecuted for it. But none of this takes us away from some particularly damning associations. Trump and Clinton keep coming up. Trump because he was good friends with Epstein for quite a long time. Uh, I was not a fan of his. That I can tell you. I was not a fan of his. And Clinton because he visited Little St. James several times, a distinction which hardly any of Epstein's associates could lay claim to. Is Monica in there? One accuser in particular claims Trump and Epstein raped her when she was 13, but it's really difficult to get at the merits of that claim. Beyond this admittedly very serious allegation, there's not very much to suggest that the two of them were doing anything beyond being sleazy old pervs together, immoral and nauseating behavior. Yes, almost certainly, but serious sexual offenses, apart from that single accuser and the fact that multiple women have accused Donald Trump of sexual misconduct and assault, there isn't anything we can grab a hold of, so to speak. It doesn't really look good though and it's pretty certain that so long as people keep digging into epstein's past as they currently are that picture might one day change as for bill clinton it's a similar if somewhat worse situation clinton has a record of promiscuity and sexual misconduct it's also widely claimed that he's repeatedly gotten away with sexual assault and these claims aren't easy to dismiss as a wild fabrication. In fact, the accusations against both Clinton and Trump have a disturbing consistency to them. In Clinton's case, there really isn't anything pointing towards a fixation with underage girls. This combined with his multiple visits to Little St. James, though, and his frequent flights on Epstein's plane make for a highly disturbing set of circumstances. In terms of solid evidence, though, uh, there's practically none, and unlike some other prominent people connected with the Epstein case, I haven't been able to find any credible accusers who name Bill Clinton. In fact, in Investigators say again and again that there's nothing to link Clinton to the sex trafficking and abuse cases. Which brings us back once again to the idea of ordinary, everyday sleaze. Bad enough in itself, but certainly not on the scale of Epstein's offending. Epstein's offending is on a rare scale. There are also wild rumors abounding around the nature of Epstein's connections to the elite. We know that his townhouse and compound on the islands were all rigged for video, and it's been posited several times that Epstein was able to get away with it for so long because he had copious blackmail material and that his death meant it could all be made to go away. This is plausible, but it's impossible to prove. And then there's the rumors that he was some kind of spy. One book claims that Acosta, in trying to explain the plea deal to an associate, said he was told to back off because Epstein was connected to intelligence. This claim hasn't been corroborated and may very well either be an error or a fabrication. But it could also be true. It's plausible. Someone like Epstein would make a fantastic intelligence asset. The access he had to world elites, combined with the absolute shed load of compromising material an intelligence officer could use to turn and burn him, make him absolutely perfect. But against this, is the problem that he spent a fair amount of effort posing as a sort of James Bond figure. He kept a loaded pistol in his bathroom and would, in the words of one of his friends, talk stupid shit to make himself seem more interesting than he really was, some of that stupid shit being dark hints that he was a spy. <laughs> I think this is the thing, like, spies don't say they're spies. Spies don't do behavior like spies because they don't want people to know they're spies. That's the point of being a spy. People who aren't spies but want you to think they're a spy are all like, well, I couldn't say if I was a spy, but you know, <laughs> I don't think so.
This doesn't invalidate the idea, but it does call into question whether the rumor arose from a kernel of truth or from Epstein's own fantasy of himself. I think in my opinion, is probably the latter. As a general rule, people who are really spying on people don't tend to say that they're spying on people. As I said, there are exceptions, of course. The MI5 officer who tried to avoid a fair jumping fine by shouting, you can't do this, I'm a spy, springs to mind, but for the most part, it's true. <laughs> I remember that. It's like, what are you doing? What seems most likely to be true here is that a small group of high-status people were possibly compromised by their association with Epstein and potentially by the things they did while associated with him. And an even smaller number appear to have been directly involved in the web of sexual transgression and abuse that surrounded him. Where almost everyone concerned is implicated, however, is in turning a blind eye to his misdeeds. Whether or not they knew the full extent of them, even the stuff he did, which was mostly or borderline legal, was pretty disgusting. And those who knew him are right to be ashamed of their association and of the fact that they didn't have a problem with a rich guy sexually exploiting the young and the poor. Yeah, that's the moral question. It's not a legal question there, like we mentioned earlier. Do you have a moral obligation to report crimes of your friends and associates? And I think there's a point, like, there's a line. There's definitely a line. It's like, some crimes? No, I'll just be like, okay, whatever. I'm not telling. But then there's a point where you get to real serious crimes, and it's like, uh, I should do something about this. And that is for every individual to make their own moral decision on where that line is for them. But the fact of the matter is that entry into the world's elites isn't necessarily a meritocracy. There's plenty of dumb, shallow, incompetent people who stumble into real wealth and power, usually by exploiting human relationships or, to put it another way, sucking up people and doing their dirty work for them. There are strong indications that that's how Epstein himself got his foot in the door. It's the reality of just how silly, shallow, and self-obsessed Epstein's circle was that speaks most strongly against an organized global conspiracy. What seems much more likely is that Epstein and Maxwell created an assembly line of sex abuse for their own dark reasons, and their silly and venal friends either didn't care, tried to ignore it, or in a few cases, actually got involved. Yeah, I think you know, for all the conspiracies and all of this stuff, this is probably the most likely explanation that we're looking at. But now, we come to the big conspiracy question. Did Jeffrey Epstein kill himself? The last chapter of Julie K. Brown's book, Perversion of Justice, is entitled Jeffrey Epstein Didn't Kill Himself. As we're probably all aware, this particular sentence was all over social media for quite a long time, and it's such a controversial topic that it's well worth devoting a section to all by itself. There are quite a few people who are 100% sure that Epstein either definitely did or definitely didn't kill himself. Anyone who's 100% sure of anything either way is... You need to open your mind to the possibility that you're wrong. All I can say is that I envy their assurance. It'd be really nice to be able to settle this issue definitively and say once and for all that Jeffrey Epstein was killed by Satanist Ninja hired by Bill Clinton or something to that effect. There's probably a conspiracy theory out there saying that, isn't there? But the real situation is much messier than that. We can, of course, all believe what we want. I'm not so sure about that. But the available evidence doesn't really allow us to prove anything one way or another. The question, was Jeffrey Epstein murdered, isn't a very productive one, as there's no evidence for it. None whatsoever. Did Jeffrey Epstein kill himself is a better question, though, as there's quite a bit of circumstantial evidence which raises significant doubts about whether he did or not. In fact, Epstein's death, ruled a suicide by hanging by the coroner, stinks to high heaven. There are so many factors which render it improbable that the only rational position is to have serious doubts as to whether his suicide was unassisted or whether it was a suicide at all. It's important to note, however, some important factors in favor of the suicide theory. Firstly, there's the fact that the Metropolitan Correctional Center, where Epstein was locked up, was a farcically poorly run facility. Yeah, there weren't the cameras out and the guards weren't there and stuff, which looks extremely suspicious until maybe you find out, yeah, the cameras are out most of the time and there aren't enough guards. <laughs> Possible. When Epstein was processed into custody, for example, he was listed as black and with no prior sex offenses. <laughs> I, mean, I get the priors right, but Jeffrey Epstein is a really white dude. 
People have since said that this was to obscure his identity, but that makes no sense. Obscure it from whom? And why, if they were trying to hide his identity, didn't they just register him under a different name? It's like, no, 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 no one will be able to get it. You're just, your, your name's Jeffrey Epstein, but we'll just write down your black and no one will be able to figure it out. You're not famous at all or part of some giant case. Right? I am the one, the way you're trying- and what would have been the point anyway for a man whom everybody in the country had seen on television, online, and in newspapers? Yes! Even the prisoners would likely have recognized him immediately, his face had been splashed around so much and for so long. And besides which, media reports show him being taken to the facility, so the whole idea is ridiculous. The hugely incompetent running of the prison does take away some of the weight of the argument that killing himself would have been physically impossible, given the level of supervision he was under. The problems with this are that people managed to kill themselves in prison all the time, and that apart from the time he was on suicide watch, there wasn't really that much extra monitoring of Epstein despite his high profile and high risk status. And then there's the 1953 Foundation. 1953 is Epstein's birth year, in case you're wondering about the name. Anyway, the 1953 Foundation was set up and filled with a huge amount of Epstein's assets a few days before his death. The Virgin Islands DOJ claims this was an attempt to hide his wealth from seizure or civil claimants, and to be fair, it was set up through numerous intermediaries and holding companies. But the problem with that is that all of Epstein's money management worked this way. He was obsessed with privacy. The holdings he was trying to hide are, for all we know, mostly still hidden, but the ones he more or less openly used were typically squirreled away into arcane labyrinth cat cradles of corporate obfuscation. Other reporters have commented that this consolidation of a large bulk of his assets, basically all his openly held and known ones into one place, could be interpreted as him cleaning house, like a jumper writing a note, tidying the house, and then taking off their spectacles before they leave off a tall building, sans parachute, or superpowers. This is interesting, but not particularly compelling, because it's equally likely that he gathered these assets into a foundation to protect the rest from litigation. Yeah, he knows he's going to jail. Which is also another reason you might be like, let's get all this stuff sorted, because when I'm in jail, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Basically, this little fact could just as easily be interpreted either way. This is what's so maddening about Epstein's death. The fact that it's so hard to grab onto anything solid or conclusive. We're on more solid ground with the circumstances of the death itself. As badly run as the MCC was, the whole thing still looks unbelievably silly. Epstein was supposed to be in the Special Housing Unit, or SHU, on suicide watch as he'd already made an attempt on his life. The shoe conditions mandate he be placed with a cellmate and that he be checked every 15 minutes. Then, the night before his death, he was transferred back to his cell. Both of the guards tasked with watching his wing managed to fall asleep at the crucial time, and of the three cameras covering the area, two were inoperable, and the third produced what was described as unusable footage. The two guards, who also falsified records to say that they conducted mandatory checks, were given 100 hours of community service and a non-custodial sentence, an oddly light penalty for being responsible for the death of such a high-value prisoner. They probably also lost their jobs, I would imagine. While the coroner ruled the death as a suicide, determining Epstein had hanged himself with a bedsheet, there were wire-like lacerations on his neck, but no blood on the sheet, and the hyoid bone, which is usually untouched by hanging, was fractured. A medical expert hired by Epstein's brother registered the opinion that he had been strangled. That is mad suspicious. The wire, the bone thing. It's like, holy sh**. And the guards? It's just like, there is so much smoke. There is so much smoke. It's gotta be a fire. On the other hand, one of Epstein's fellow inmates who'd become somewhat close to him claims that all the signs were there, saying that he'd gone into his cell one day and found him eating his dinner on the floor because it was easier. He says that he knew Epstein had given up on life. I say that's pretty flimsy. No individual piece of evidence here can be taken as conclusive proof that Epstein either was or wasn't murdered. No, not even the hyoid bone thing or the lacerations. But to put it all together, it's highly suspicious. I don't think any reasonable person can say with absolute certitude that Epstein decided to kill himself. Sure, he had attempted suicide already, and sure, the MCC was so shambolically run that it could explain the cameras. And as for the guards, I personally worked with sentries and found many of them to be constantly trying to bunk off for a nap and falsifying their records of rounds and logs of observation. The conjunction of all these factors, however, converging at the exact same time of Epstein's death, combined with the highly unusual post-mortem details, cast serious doubt on the coroner's verdict. There was even a large and powerful group of people who would have found Epstein's death convenient, and some of them were more capable than either Donald Trump or Bill Clinton of the kind of skullduggery needed to pull the levers on someone 
in prison. And then there's the fact that Jean-Luc Brunel, allegedly a procurer of underage models for Epstein and in French prison on rape and other charges, apparently hanged himself in his cell with a bedsheet less than three years later. We've got to stress here that nothing has been proven about any of this. But as we say in Australia, this doesn't really pass the pub test, and I think it's eminently reasonable to be highly suspicious of this highly suspicious chain of circumstances. Yeah, it's again, it's one of those things where it's like it's like the JFK thing at the beginning. There is a lot of smoke. It's really weird. There's definitely something going on. Do I know what it is? No. Do I think we'll ever find out? Probably not. Probably the same with what's going on with Epstein here. Do I think there's something suspicious? Hell yes. It's very suspicious. Julie K. Brown and others believe that Epstein's death may have been a sort of assisted suicide. Let's say you're a rich and powerful person who's likely to be compromised by an Epstein trial. And let's further say you hear the guy's already suicidal and has been trying to kill himself unsuccessfully. It'd be reasonable, if you had the means, to reach into a fantastically corrupt and incompetent prison and make it a bit easier for Epstein to do what he's already trying to do. That's a favoured theory among many, and like we've repeatedly said, there's no real evidence for it. All the evidence really points to is doubt. So I guess we'll just have to watch what happens to Ghislaine Maxwell and hope that one of the many Freedom of Information requests, or perhaps the 30-year rule, will one day reveal the actual truth, whatever that is. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. Jeffrey Epstein survived by his brother Mark Epstein, a prominent businessman and philanthropist. Mark isn't accused of being involved in his brother's wrongdoing and has even been involved in the process of setting up Jeffrey Epstein's estate's victim restitution fund. Having said all of that, some tabloids have pointed out that he ran a modeling agency, allowed Epstein to host models in some of his real estate, and has a very slightly checkered business past. On the balance, though, it seems Mark Epstein is clean and he's genuinely disturbed by what his brother did. And what happened to him. Number two. Apart from Jelaine Maxwell, Epstein's alleged accomplices are still at large, and until a court tests the idea, they're in theory immune from prosecution. The strap on lady Nadia Marcinkova, for example, is a commercial pilot and a high profile Instagram personality. Her business appears to have been seed funded by Epstein. Sarah Kellen, who's described by many victims from the pre Maxwell era as the factotum who organized their massage appointments and showed them the massage room or bedroom, is an interior designer married to NASCAR driver. Her business is also registered to an Epstein property. Mark's, though, not Jeffrey's. Number 3. Epstein reportedly donated $100,000 to Ballet Florida's massage fund as daily massages are an important part of any professional dancer's routine. That's weird, my dude. Why would you do that? It's interesting, if a bit creepy, to think that Epstein's own obsession with massages may have prompted him to think of this otherwise somewhat random means of charitable giving. That's so creepy. That's so creepy. <laughs> It's just creepy because it's from Jeffrey Epstein, Jesus. Number four. Those of Epstein's closest associates who have agreed to speak with journalists have often defended his actions. Some, including the parents of a girl Epstein paid for sex but who never made a complaint, suggest that his generous payments made the whole arrangement not only morally fine but commonplace. Holy sh**, my dude. That's your kid. What the f***? Others say the relations between older men and young girls only became taboo recently. That's not true. That's not true. Like people getting married in the past and stuff, like younger, that's that's largely just not historically accurate. That's that's super that and if you find yourself saying that, that's a super creepy thing to say. That's a super creepy thing to say. And that Epstein is a victim of changing times and Me Too hysteria. What the f are you talking about? Jeffrey Epstein is a sex trafficking predator, pedophile, a victim of the Me Too in my f ass what the f are you talking about needless to say neither the law basic morality or common sense agree with these points of view and if you find yourself agreeing with these points of view your morality compass is off number five there are dozens of civil complaints still outstanding against the epstein estate and Ghislaine maxwell's conviction is likely to trigger even more civil trials differ from criminal trials in the way they deal with evidence and much of what we know about epstein's operation come from the unsealing of criminal evidence as part of civil proceedings if this continues there's actually a chance that much of the mystery and suspicion around who exactly was involved and how exactly epstein died may come out in the not too distant future i for one hope that it does and those involved are held accountable for their disgusting crimes yeah i think we can all hope for that um because this is a horrible story about a horrible man and some horrible people that surround him and also just this disgusting miscarriage of justice that the rich and powerful seem to be able to perpetrate which is absolutely it's just absolutely mad 
This has been an episode of Casual Criminalist. I hope you didn't enjoy it because it was horrible. Um, leave us a review if you're listening as a podcast. That would be awesome. Spotify now accepts ratings. Go give us a rating if you're on Spotify. Thank you very much. Uh, YouTube, subscribe, like, and I'll see you next time.